Coming up, a Canadian woman is fighting back against fraudulent Indigenous art sales and we visit with Clinkett artist Mary Goddard. Plus, we'll hear from a poet who added their 13-year-old's illustrations to their new book of poems. I am Leah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amidala Holpa, thank you for joining us. The state of Oklahoma's appeal in the McGirt case is set, and the Supreme Court has scheduled or oral arguments for April 27th. In January, the High Court agreed to hear the case at the same time that it refused Oklahoma's request to overturn the ruling. State officials say federal authorities are overwhelmed since the court's ruling. However, in 2022 alone, the Cherokee Nation has invested $30 million for an expansion of its criminal justice system. The nation's principal chief, Chuck Hoskin Jr., spoke to ICT, restating how the law supports his tribe. Let's remember, McGirt is really about expanding the geographic scope of Cherokee Nation's authority to protect people, to enforce its criminal laws, to bring people to justice and to protect victims. The nation recently celebrated the one-year anniversary of official recognition of its tribal territory due to the ruling. Indigenous people who are searching for housing assistance services can now get a little help with their hunt. The National American Indian Housing Council has launched an online resource hub for tribal housing assistance. The website can be used as a tool for finding tribal housing services offered on and off Native lands. Anyone who is American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian can use it. The website lists mortgage, utilities, and rental assistance services offered by state and tribal programs. For some families across Indian country, emergency housing assistance can be a vital tool to keep a roof over their heads. Tony Walters, executive director of the national organization, says Native people may even benefit from multiple funding sources. We, we talked about a lot of Native Americans living outside tribal communities. We want to get them access to the program wherever they live. So often that can be the state or local program. And we want to make sure they know that's available to them, that they're not restricted uh, based on being a Native American. And it's quite the opposite. They're actually going to be able to benefit from possibly both sources of funding or assistance by being able to work with their county or state and working with their home tribe. The website was created in partnership with Wells Fargo. South Dakota's missing and murdered Indigenous persons investigator is receiving funding from an unlikely place. Native Hope, an outreach program of the St. Joseph's Indian School, gave more than $250,000 to fund the investigator position. The job was created in the South Dakota Attorney General's office and has gone unfulfilled for the past two lawmaking sessions. Some Indigenous leaders in the state point to reluctance from Republicans to apply for federal funds. Oglala Lala Citizen and State Representative Puri Poyer proposed the position last year. She told ICT this is not just a tribal issue. What I didn't want anyone to say was that this was a solely tribal issue. So I took, broke down the numbers further and I said, well, let's break it down to geographical area. So that turned out to be 33 of the 77 missing and murdered indigenous persons came from the Rapid City, Pennington County and Box Elder area of South Dakota. Those are urban areas um, west, west, west of the Missouri River. The Flandreau Santee Sioux tribe released a statement last month saying it is willing to pay for half of the investigator's salary for two years. In Arizona, a Navajo police officer has died. 
According to the Arizona Department of Safety, 54-year-old Sergeant Leo Basenti Jr. was hit by an oncoming car. Basenti was off duty at the time of the incident in Kingman, Arizona on March 9th. Tribal leaders offered their condolences, including Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez. Navajo Vice President Myron Lizer said he is praying for Basenti's family. Basenti was a 23-year veteran and first began his career as a state trooper in 1998. He is survived by his wife, children, and grandchild. There are two indigenous chefs who may soon win big. Chefs Crystal Wapapa and Sean Sherman are both serious contenders for major restaurant awards. Both were announced last week as finalists for the 2022 James Beard Award. This prestigious award recognizes culinary professionals in the United States. Wapapa, who is Kickapoo, runs Wapapa's Kitchen in Oakland and is in the emerging, emerging chef category. Sherman is up for Best Chef Midwest and his restaurant, Owamni by the Sioux Chef in Minneapolis, is up for best new restaurant. All of the winners will be announced on June 13th. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, Tate Walker tells us how their book of poetry became a family project. Plus, we'll hear from a Canadian woman working to protect Indigenous artists. But first, there's a saying in the Clinket language, when the tide goes out, the table is set. We'll introduce you to a Clinket woman who is blogging about Indigenous foods from Alaska. Stay with us. As we celebrate Women's History Month, we're taking a look at one woman who is Clinket. Mary Goddard is an artist and her work runs the gamut from jewelry to food. Her artwork can be seen in Sitka, Juno, and even on a food blog. Hi, Mary. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Tell us about your food blog. Yeah, um, my food blog is called Forest Fresh Alaska. And um, it's a food blog that I do with my husband, Lucas, our son, Riker, um, even my sister, Samantha, is part of the team, and our mother-in-law helps with uh, all the beautiful tablescaping when we do photos. And where did this idea start for you to begin this blog? You know, I've always had a love of food, and I think what's so special and unique about living in a rainforest is the, the bounty of food. And a lot of that knowledge has been lost. So it was kind of a fun, like treasure of trying to um, uncover, you know, what foods can we forage for that are edible? Um, what, um, you know, just beyond the hunting and the fishing, but really including, you know, the wealth of resources that we have into our food. So it's just been a lot of fun. You mentioned that your son Riker is part of the food blog. Um, tell us how you make food that is tailored for children. Yeah, I think um, when you get children involved in the foraging, hunting, or fishing aspect, they or any part of you know knowing where your food comes from, um, they get really excited to help cook and prepare. And they also know how much work goes into it. And so with Riker, his favorite thing is foraging and fishing. And um, he's excited to start hunting this year. Um, but it, it's just, it's fun when you're out in the forest and you get to, you know, discover plants that are edible. And, um, so I think just involving them in that process is, makes it really, you know, kid friendly. When you're foraging for food, how do you take into account the seasons? Because I imagine sometimes it's extremely cold. Sometimes it's probably nicer weather, but how are you sort of foraging for food at different times during the year? Yeah. Hey, really good question. Because when, you know, we're in Southeast, when the food is ready, you got to harvest it right away. And then um, for those winter months when there's not too much out, you know, we put up, you know, whether it's drying um, or freezing our food and, uh, and then we're able to use it throughout the winter months when there's really not much out. As I mentioned in my opening, March is Women's History Month, and I'd love to ask you the question about which women you admire in your own life. Oh, man. Well, that's an easy one. Uh, my mother, you know, she's, um, she's just a natural teacher. So anything we did growing up, she was just constantly teaching, whether it was how to, you know, um, uh, prepare food. And then, um, 
I guess also my sister, Samantha, just because she has such a good heart and she's always really kind to everyone. And I feel like those are really good qualities I like about people, the teaching aspect, and then also the kindness. I love that. Those are also so important to me. And um, I always love when and when people talk about their moms, because mine is so special to me. So it's always a, a good feeling to hear about that. I want to switch gears and actually talk about your filmmaking. Um, tell us more about what projects you've had uh, come up recently. Yeah. Um, so projects that we had this last year were really focused on um, highlighting our rural communities in Southeast Alaska. And that was really exciting because sometimes um, these communities don't get a lot of photos or video assets. And so the network I work within, the Sustainable Southeast Partnership, we thought that was really important to highlight them and, um, you know, just showcase uh, the beauty of these communities and the artists there and the small business owners. So when you're going out and talking to folks, how are they saying the pandemic has impacted them? You know, this is one push for the food blog. Um, the pandemic has really affected our small communities in the fact that we realize how um, insecure we are with our food sources. You know, most of our food is shipped in probably 80 to 90%. And so that leaves us really vulnerable. Um, so just bringing the knowledge of uh, what you can eat and what you can harvest locally, I think would, um, would be really beneficial. And I can imagine now that inflation is on the rise, those numbers and those prices increase even higher. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, just being able to um, highlight um, food that you can harvest locally is going to help on so many different levels. You know, the food insecurity issues or security issues, as well as um, helps you save money. Sure. Well, Mary, uh, I want to end with one last question, and that's what advice you would give to women who maybe want to start a food blog or someone who's interested in addressing food insecurity in their own communities? I would say just go for it. And, you know, there's always something to learn. Um, you probably already know a little bit of information. So start with you with what you have and let it grow. All righty. Well, Mary, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Tate Walker is an award-winning storyteller who is debuting a new book of poetry called The Trickster Riots. When it is released this June, the book will include illustrations by Tate's 13-year-old trans-slash-non-binary child who is a painter and graphic artist. Hi, Tate. Welcome to the ICT Newscast. I'm Peter Washte. Thank you for having me. So let's just jump right in. Tell us how long you've been writing poetry. I think a lot of poets we have to say since birth, you know, just I came out as a poem, eh? but I started in my, you know, teen years as an angsty, you know, coming up queer and then uh, kind of stopped it actually. You know, I had teachers that were very set on how poems should look and that, that hit me in the wrong way. So I stopped and then it was 2019 actually that I was asked to read some poetry here in Phoenix where I'm based. And from there, it just sort of folks kept asking me to do it. So uh, professionally since 2019, I guess. Was writing a book of poetry ever something that you intended on doing? How did that project start for you? Never, never intended to write poetry for anyone except my you know, deepest internal self. It was going to be something, you know, my kid and grandkids one day discovered and were like, this is amazing, but also really dark. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm I'm a trained journalist. I have almost <laughs> almost two decades of uh, journalism under my belt with uh, magazine editing, uh, daily newspapers. And that's the kind of writing I've, I've always done. So poetry is a definite detour but it's been super fun and uh, I've discovered that it, it really takes shape in a lot of different ways. What prompted you to want to write this book now given that you just said you know you were trained in journalism you never thought that this was something you were going to do why now? Yeah so why now is I have people who believe in me. I think uh, you know the pandemic's been terrible right uh, full stop but it also allowed for a lot of introspection and a lot of time to myself to talk about uh, you know internally 
what's important? What are my priorities? And poetry was really becoming a place that I could connect with folks that journalism couldn't, uh, that, that uh, you know, Zoom couldn't. And that was really exciting uh, to explore. And then it was also a place that I could connect with my own kiddo as uh, uh, two indigiqueers, you know, we were, we, this was a fantastic and new way for us to build our relationship. Yeah, that is so wonderful. I actually want to talk more about that because Ohia, your child, actually will have illustrations in this book. Tell us how that collaboration came to be. Super exciting. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled that our publisher, Abalone Mountain Press, was was okay with that. I don't think folks think of poetry as something that's uh, beyond a metaphorically visual piece. Uh, and it was great to have a, a poem sort of set in a physical illustrative uh, framework, I guess. And so my kiddo, fantastic artist, and I don't just say that as a mom, uh, they have you know, been awarded prizes at various uh, Indian art markets and having their work accompany my poems uh, made it poetic in and of its own self. So how does, how does a poem get expressed visually? And that's something my kiddo explored. And uh, I, I mean, I hope they don't say later on, you know, my, my mom forced me to do it. Uh, but I think they're pretty excited about it there that when we were told that we would have a, a book in hand in June, uh, there was some uh, thrilled squeeing in our house. Ah, so I, I think uh, we're all pretty jazzed uh, what we've created. I actually want to talk more about the book itself. Give us a preview of what kinds of themes and topics that we can expect to explore in this book. Sure. Uh, it, it's a love poem of sorts, uh, especially to uh, you know my indigiqueer youth self. Uh, there wasn't anything that celebrated uh, indigeneity or queerness when I was a kid. Both were very real negative things, right? Um, I was in North Dakota and in a group home and being indigenous and being queer was was not was not okay. So having this poetry book, I think, is a celebration of that piece of myself. It's a celebration of that piece of my kiddo who you know came out about a year ago as trans non and binary. Um, yeah, so so it's a it's a magical place to be for sure. We're trying to make it a magical place, but we're also in a state in a nation that's actively anti LGBTQ two spirit and that's that's it's a risk to come out in this way to come out with a book that celebrates queerness and celebrates indigeneity and um i think it couldn't come at a better time either and so those themes are in there being indigenous is is all of it the trickster riots is a nod to uh lakota storytelling with our trickster who's ikotomi and so that plays a major theme in the issues that i've just discussed queerness and indigeneity Tate, who is this book intended for? Do you think it's intended for indigenous folks? Is it intended for non-natives? Tell us about your intended audience. You know, I, I, I think it sells more books when you say it's uh, for everyone, but it's definitely for a, a young adult indigiqueer who doesn't have anywhere else to go and wants to see themselves flourish and thrive on the page and in illustrations and in the world. I have just one last question for you. Um, for the poet who's watching this, the one who writes for themselves, what message do you have for them? I think when it comes to being indigenous, there's this aspect of community that is so important. Whether you're reconnecting as indigenous or you've been a part of your community and family forever, uh, poetry is another way to connect and it's another way to be a part of the community. And when you uplift your community, you're uplifting yourself. And that's what I hope this book does for folks and what poetry can do for, for our people. Well, Tate, thank you so much. Thank you.
For 26 years, Lucinda Turner carved with an indigenous Nixa artist. During that time, she found a passion in combating fraudulent art. Turner discovered that the works of indigenous artists were being stolen and listed on the internet for sale. She turned this investigation into a full-time job and currently writes takedown letters on behalf of 50 artists. She has sent out over a thousand letters to 30 different internet companies. Hello, Lucinda, and welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Let's start from the beginning. How did you get involved in this work? Well, after my partner died in 2016, I was informed that there were copies of his masks, as well as 15 other artists, um, which had been taken out of a book uh, by Gary Wyatt called Spirit Faces. And this book was sent to the Philippines and reproduced. These masks and totems were shipped back into Vancouver. And I found four bills of lading uh, equaling 500,000 kilograms per container coming in from uh, the Philippines through Manila, Hong Kong, ending up in Tacoma, then coming across the border and being sold online and on the streets of Vancouver. So I was incensed and I started doing more research. Tell us about the major projects you've investigated. Well, the masks are one thing. Um, there's a lot of masks that have been coming over overseas. Um, those you can tell by the wood, it's it's really obvious when you get familiar with the wood itself. It's not indigenous to British Columbia. Um, so that's a big red flag. Knowing and also knowing that artists, they they've not given their permission, they have no knowledge of it, and they certainly get no compensation for it. Um, in the case of the orange shirt and missing and murdered indigenous women, um, this summer was particularly bad. Starting literally the day after May 28th when the, um, the unmarked graves were found, there were stolen designs up on different sales platforms on Facebook, just within hours of it happening. And it continued all summer long. Um, I was writing 20 to 30 DMCA letters a day and I continued that all summer. Literally, it was over 1,500 letters I sent with about a, I have to say, 98% uh, success rate in bringing them down for the most case. But it was overwhelming, you know, it, it, and it hurts the community so badly. You know, it's more exploitation, more abuse, and just... Um, it's disgusting, to be honest with you. It, it infuriates me and it drives me forward. So literally last night I went back and I wrote another 15 now that I caught my wind after the last presentation. <laughs> so I'm back at it again. <laughs> what are some of the biggest red flags you see when you're doing this work? Well, knowing that the artists don't get um, any compensation, they they don't know that this is happening until we bring it to their attention in the group it's great uh we all work together everybody identifies them they bring them up if we're not sure of the design then everybody will will pitch in because we're full of artists in that group um that that's sort of the first indication and then going into orange shirts which is a bit of you know my irritant uh, is is the the pictures are the same the stock pictures are the same no matter what company you're going with so that's a clue you know you look you look deeper into the companies they're usually from either the states or often from China Vietnam the Philippines um, all over so those those situations are huge red flags we know that these these monies that are supposed to be for fundraising for residential school survivors and missing and murdered indigenous women and girl survivors is just being uh, diverted to these unscrupulous buyers and Facebook I have to say isn't doing a darn thing about it I write long letters to them, and sometimes I get no reply, but I will get action. They'll disappear. But 
there's no regulatory system, whether it's in our legislation um, or, or on Facebook itself. I want to end on a good note. What are some of the success stories that you've had? Oh, uh, well, getting all these items down, you know, being able to send a letter and within sometimes 15 minutes, these items are removed. Um, there was one company called First Canada out of China, and they had many items with, you know, free to decent, like very well established artists who had passed. And they would take their designs and mix them with nonsensical form line designs that people didn't know what they were doing with, mix them all up. And after all the DMCA letters, we took down the whole native division collection. You know, those kind of things are very satisfying. You know, um, same with the wood, to be able to, to, to send a letter, and I have a I have good letters. You know, I've been helped by lawyers and um, they do respond. They have to respond because of the, the Copyright Millennium Act. They have no choice. So that, that gives us power, you know, and what I like to do is when an artist uh, gets their piece stolen now, instead of me writing the letter, I take my letter and I work it for them. I make a URL with a watermarked uh, image of their original and I give it to them. So they're now empowered to be able to send a really strong letter, which happened yesterday with a missing and murdered Indigenous women piece. So very satisfying. Very, very satisfying. Well, Lucinda, thank you for your time. You're welcome. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run, you got to run.